good wishes to all of you history of modern india chapter 4 the structure of government and the economic policies of the british empire in india 1757 to 1857 audiobook having acquired a vast empire india the east india company had to devise a suitable methods of government to control and administer it the administrative policy of the company underwent frequent changes during the long period between 1757 and 1857 However, it never lost sight of its main objects which were to increase the company's profits and hence the profitability of its Indian possessions to Britain and maintain and strengthen the British hold over India. All other purposes were subordinated to these aims. The administrative machinery of the government of India was designed and developed to serve these ends. The main emphasis in this respect was placed on the maintenance of law and order. so their trade with india and the exploitation of its resources could be carried on undisturbed sorry undisturbed the structure of government when the officials of the india east india company acquired control over bengal in 1765 they had little intention of making any innovations in its administration they only desired to carry on their profitable trade and collect taxes from for remission to england From 1765 to 1772 in the period of the dual government India officials were allowed to function as before but under the overall control of the British governor and British officials the Indian officials had responsibility but no power while the company's officials had power but no responsibility both sets of officials were venal and corrupt men in 1772 the company under the dual government had undertook to administer Bengal directly through its own servants but the evils inherent in the administration of a country by a purely commercial company soon came to the surface the east india company was at this time a commercial body designed to trade with the east moreover its higher authority was situated in england many thousands of kilometers away from india yet it had come to wield political power over millions of people this enormous state of affairs posed many problems for the british government what was to be the relation of the east india company and its possessions to the government in britain how were the company's authorities in britain to control the greater multitude of officials and soldiers stationed in far away india how was a single center of control to be provided in india over the far flung british possessions in bengal madras and bombay the first of these problems was the most pressing as well as the most important it was also closely interwoven with the party and parliamentary rivalries in britain the political ambitions of english statesmen and the commercial greed of english merchants the rich resources of bengal had fallen into the hands of the company whose directors immediately raised dividends dividends to 10% in 1767 and proposed in 1771 to raise the rate further to 12 12.5% the company's english servants took advantage of their position to make quick fortunes through illegal and unequal trade and the forcible collection of bribes and gifts from indian chiefs and zamindars clive returned to england at the age of 34 with a wealth and a property yielding of 40000 euros per year the company's high dividends and the fabulous wealth brought home by its officials excited the jealousy of other sections of british society merchants kept out of the east by the monopoly of the company the growing class class of manufacturers and in general the rising forces of free enterprise in britain wanted to share in the profitable indian trade and the riches of india which the company and its servants alone were enjoying the their work worked hard to destroy the company's trade monopoly and in order to achieve this they attacked the company's administration of bengal they also made the officials of the company who returned from india their special target these officials were given the there is a title of nabobs and uh, were ridiculed in the press and on the stage they were boycotted by the ar- aristocracy and condemned as the exploiters and oppressors of the indian people their two main targets were clive and warren hastings by condemning the nabobs uh, the opponents of the company hoped to make the company unpopular and then to displace it many ministers and other ministers of pa- um, other members of parliament were keen to 
benefit from the acquisition of Bengal. They sought to win popular support by forcing the company to pay tribute to the British government so that Indian revenues could be used to reduce taxation or the public debt of England. In 1767, the parliament passed an act obliging the company to pay to the British Treasury 44 uh, lakh euros per year. Many political thinkers and statesmen of Britain wanted to control the activities of the company and its officials because they were afraid that the powerful company and its rich officials would completely debauch the English nation and its policies. The parliamentary politi politics of Britain during the later half of the 18th century was corrupt in the extreme. The company as well as its re retired officials brought seats in the House of Commons for their agents. Many English statesmen were worried that the company and its officials, backed by Indian plunder, might gain a preponderant influence in the government of Britain. The company and its vast empire in India had to be controlled or the company as master of India would soon come to control British administration and be in a position to destroy the liberties of the British people. The exclusive privileges of the company were also attacked by the rising school of economists representing free trade manufacturing capitalism. In his celebrated work, The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, the founder of classical economics, condemned the exclusive companies. Such exclusive companies, therefore, are nuisances in many respects, always more or less inconvenient to the countries in which they are established and destructive to those which have the misfortune to fall under their government. Thus, reorganization of the relations between the British state and the company's authorities became necessary and the occasion arose when the company had to ask the government for a loan of 1300 euros. But while the company's enemies were many and powerful, it was not without powerful friends in parliament. Moreover, the King George III was its patron. The company therefore fought back. In the end, the parliament worked out a compromise by which the interest of the uh, company and of the various uh, influential sections of uh, British society were delicately balanced. It was decided that the British government would control the basic policies of the company's Indian administration so that British rule in India was carried on the carried on in the interests of the British upper classes as a whole. At the same time, the company would retain its monopoly over Eastern trade and the valuable right to appoint its officials in India. The details of Indian administration were also left to the directors of the company. The first important parliamentary act regarding the company's efforts was the Regulating Act of 1773. This act made changes in the constitution of the court of directors of the company and subjected their actions to the supervision of the British government. The Regulating Act soon broke down in practice. It had not given the British government effective and decisive control over the company. The Act had also failed to resolve the conflict between the company and its opponents in England, who were daily growing stronger and more vocal. Moreover, the company remained extremely vulnerable to the attacks of its enemies as the administration of its Indian positions continued to be corrupt, oppressive, and economically distrustful. The defects of the Regulating Act and the existences, exigences of British politics necessitated the passing in 1784 of another important act known as the British Indian Act. This act gave the British government supreme control over the company's affairs and its administration in India. It established six commissioners for the affairs of India, popularly known as the Broad Board of Control, including two cabinet ministers. The Board of Control was to guide and control the work of the Court of Directors and the Government of India. The Act placed the Government of India in the hands of the Governor-General and a Council of Three, so that if the Governor-General could get the support of even one member, he could have his way. The Act clearly subordinated the Bombay and Madras presidencies to Bengal in all questions of war, diplomacy and revenues. With this Act began a new phase of the British conquest of India, while the East India Company became the instrument of British national policy. India was to be made to serve the interests of all sections of the ruling classes of Britain.
the company having served its monopoly over Indian and Chinese trade was satisfied. Its directors uh, retained a profitable right of appointing and dismissing its British officials in India. Moreover, the government of India was to be carried on through their agency, while the British Indian Act laid down the general framework in which the government of India was to be carried on till 1857. Later enactments brought about several important changes which gradually dimensioned the powers and privileges of the company. In 1786, the Governor General was given the authority to overrule his council in matters of importance affecting safety, peace or in or the interests of the empire in India. By the Charter Act of 1813, the trade monopoly of the company in India was ended and trade with India was thrown open to all British subjects. But trade in tea and trade with China were still exclusive to the company. The government and the revenues of India continued to be in the hands of the company. The company also continued to appoint its officials in India. The Charter Act of 1833 brought the company's monopoly of tea trade and trade with China to an end. At the same time, the debts of the company were taken over by the government of India, which was also to pay its shareholders a 10.5% divided on their capital. The government of India continued to be run by the company under the strict control of the Board of Control. Thus, the various, various acts of parliament discussed above completely subordinated the company and its uh, Indian administration to the British government. At the same time, it was recognized that the day-to-day -day administration of India could not be run or even superintended from a distance of uh, 6,000 miles. Supreme authority in India was, therefore, Delegated to the Governor General in Council, the Governor General having the authority to overrule his council on important questions became in fact the real effective ruler of India, functioning under the superintendence, control and the direction of the British government. The British created a new system of administration in India to serve their purposes, but before we discuss the salient features of this system, it would be better if we first examine the purposes which it was designed to serve for the main function of our the function of the administrative system of a country is to accomplish the aims and ob objectives of its uh, rulers. The chief aim of the British was to enable them to exploit India economically to the maximum advantage of various British interests, ranging from the company to the luxury manufacturers. In 1793, Lord Cornwall's the Governor General defined two primary objects for the Bengal government. It must ensure its political safety and it must render the position of the country as advantageous as possible to the East India Company and the British nation. At the same time, India was to be made to bear the full cost of its own conquest as well as of foreign rule. An examination of the economic policies of British in, British in India is, therefore, of prime importance. British Economic Policies in India 1757-1857 Commercial Policy From 1600 to 1757, the East India Company's role in India was that of a trading corporation which brought goods or precious metals into India and exchanged them for Indian goods like textiles and spices which it then sold abroad. Its profits came primarily from the sale of Indian goods abroad. Naturally, it tried constantly to open new markets for Indian goods in Britain and other countries. Thereby, it increased the export of Indian manufacturers and thus increased their produ production. This is why Indian rulers tolerated and even encouraged the establishment of the company's factories in India. But from the very beginning, British manufacturers were jealousy of Jealous of the popularity that Indian textiles enjoyed in Britain. All of a sudden, dress fashion fashions changed and light cotton textiles began to replace the coarse woolens of the English. Earlier, the author of the famous novel Robinson Crusoe had complained that Indian cloth had crept into our houses, our closets, and bed chambers, curtains, cushions, chairs, and at last, beds themselves were nothing but calicos or India stuffs. The British manufacturers put pressure on their 
government to restrict and prohibit the sale of indian goods in england by 1720 laws had been passed forbidding the wear or use of printed or dyed cotton cloth in 1760 a lady had to pay a fine of uh, 200 euros for possessing an important handkerchief moreover heavy duties were imposed on the import of plain cloth other european countries except holland also either prohibited the import of indian cloth or imposed heavy import duties in spite of these laws however indian silk and cotton textiles still held their own in foreign markets until the middle of the 18th century when the english textile industry began to develop on the basis of new and advanced technology after the battle of plassey in 1757 the pattern of the company's commercial relations with the india underwent a qualitative change now the company could use its uh, political control over bengal to acquire monopol- monopolistic uh, control over indian trade and production and push its uh, indian trade moreover it utilized the revenues of bengal to finance its uh, export of indian goods the activity of the company should have encouraged indian manufacturers for india exports to britain went up from 1.5 million euros in 1750 to 51 to 5.8 million euros in 1797-98 but this was not so the company used its political power to dictate terms to the weavers of bengal who were forced to sell their products at a cheaper and a dictated price even at a loss moreover their labor was no longer free many of them were compelled to work for the company for low wages and forbidden to work for indian merchants the company eliminated its rival traders both indian and foreign and prevented prevented them from offering higher wages or prices to the bengal handicraftsmen the servants of the company monopolized the sale of raw cotton and made the bengal weaver pay exorbitant prices for it thus the weaver lost both ways as a buyer as well as a seller at the same time indian textiles had to pay heavy duties on entering england the british government was determined to protect its rising machine industry whose products could still not compete with the cheaper and better indian goods even though indian products uh, held some of their ground the real blow to indian handicrafts fell after 1813 when they lost not only their foreign markets but what was of much greater importance their market in india itself the industrial revolution in britain completely transformed britain's economy and its economic relations with india during the second half of the 18th century and the first few decades of the 19th Brit- uh, britain underwent a profound social and economic transformation and british industry developed and expanded rapidly on the basis of modern machines the factory system and capitalism this development was aided by several factors british overseas trade had been expanding rapidly in the previous centuries Brit- britain had come to capture and monopolize many foreign markets by means of war and colonialism these export markets enabled its export industries to expand production rapidly utilizing the latest techniques in production and organization africa the west indies latin america canada australia china and above all india provided unlimited opportunities for export this was particularly true of the cotton textile industry which served as the main vehicle of the industrial revolution in britain britain had already evolved the colonial pattern of trade that helped the industrial revolution which in turn strengthened this pattern the colonies and under developed countries exported agricultural and mineral raw materials to britain while they later sold them in its manufactures second there was sufficient capital accumulated in the country for investment in new machinery and the factory system moreover this capital was concentrated not in the hands of the feudal class which would waste it in luxurious living but in the hands of merchants and industrialists who were keen to invest it in trade and industry here again the immense wealth drawn from africa asia the west indies and latin america including that drawn from india by the east india company and its servants after the battle of plassey 
played an important role in financing industrial expansion. Third, the rapid increase in population met the need of the growing industries for more and cheaper labor. The population of Britain increased rapidly after 1740. It doubled in 50 years after 1780. Fourth, fourth, Britain had a government which was under the influence of commercial and manufacturing interests and which therefore fought other countries determinedly for markets and colonies. Fifth, the demands of her increase production were met by developments in technology. Britain's rising industry could base itself on the inventions of Hargreaves, Watt, Crampton, Cartwright, and many others. Many of the in inventions now utilized had been available for centuries in order to take full advantage of these innovation inventions and steam power production was now increasingly concentrated in factories. It should be noted that it was not these inventions that produced the industrial revolution. Rather, it was desire of manufacturers to increase production rapidly for the expanding markets and their capacity to invest the needed capital which led them to utilize the existing technology and to call forth the new inventions. In fact, the new organizations of industry was to make a technical change a permanent feature of human development. The industrial revolution has, in this sense, never come to an end for modern industry and technology have continued to develop from one stage to another ever since the middle of the 18th century. The industrial revolution transformed, transformed British society in a fundamental manner. It led to rapid economic development which is a foundation of today's high standard of living in Britain as well as in Europe, the Soviet Union, the USA, Canada, Australia and Japan. In fact, until the beginning of the 19th century, the difference in the standards of living of what are today economically the advanced and the backward countries was not marked. It was the absence of the industrial revolution in the later group of countries which has led to the immense income gap that, were, that we see in the world of today. Britain became increasingly urbanized as a result of the industrial revolution. More and more people began to live in factory towns. In 1750, Britain had only two cities with more than 50,000 inhabitants. In 1851, the numbers were 29. Two entirely new classes of society were born, the industrial capitalists who owned the factories and workers who hired out their labor for daily wages, while the former class developed rapidly, enjoying unprecedented prosperity, the workers, the laboring poor, in the beginning, a reaped a harvest of sorrow. They were uprooted from their rural surroundings and their traditional way of life was disrupted and destroyed. They now had to live in cities which were full of smoke and filth. Housing was utterly inadvocate and insanitary. Most of them lived in dogs, dark sunless slums which have been described so well in the novels of Charles Dickens. The working hours in the factories and mines were intolerably long, often going up to 14 or 16 hours a day, wages were very low. Women and children had to work equally hard. Sometimes four or five year old children were employed in factories and mines. In general, a worker's life was one of poverty, hard work, disease and malnutrition. Uh, it was only after the middle of the 19th century that improvement in their incomes began to take place. The rise of a powerful class of manufacturers had an important uh, impact on Indian administration and its policies. And the interest of this uh, class in the empire was very differ different uh, from that of the East India Company. It did not gain from the monopolization of the export of Indian handicrafts or the direct appropriation of Indian revenues. As this class grew in number and strength, in strength and political influence, it began to attack the trade monopoly of the company. Since the profits of this class came from manufacturing and not from trading, it wanted to encourage not imports of manufacturers from India, 
but exports of its own products to India as well as imports of raw materials like raw cotton from India. In 1769, the British industrialists compelled the company by law to export every year British manufacturers amounting amounting to over three lakh eighty thousand euros, even though it suffered a loss on the transaction. Transaction in seventeen ninety three, they forced the company to grant them the use of three thousand. tons of its uh, shipping every year to carry their goods exports of british uh, cotton goods to the east mostly in mostly to india increased from 156 euros in 1794 to nearly 1 lakh 10000 euros in 1813 that is ne- that is by nearly 700 times but this increase was not enough to satisfy the wild hopes of the lancashire manufacturers who began to actively search for ways and means of prompting the export of their production products and products to india as r c dud pointed out later in 1901 in his famous work the economic history of india the effort of the parliamentary select committee of 18th world was to discover how the Indian manufacturers could be replaced by British manufacturers, and how British industries could be prompted at the expense of Indian industries. The British manufacturers looked upon the East India Company, its monopoly of Eastern trade, and its methods of exploitation of India through control of India's revenues and export trade, as the chief obstacles in the fulfilment of their dreams. Between seventeen ninety three and Eighteen thirteen, they launched a powerful campaign against the company and its commercial privileges, and finally succeeded in eighteen thirteen in abolishing its monopoly of Indian trade. With this event, a new phase in Britain's economic relations with India began. Agricultural India was to be made an economic colony of industrial England. The government of India not now followed the policy of free trade or. and restricted entry to british goods india handicrafts were exposed to the fierce and unequal competition of the machine made products of britain and faced an extension india had to admit uh, british goods free or at nominal tariff rates the government of india also tried to increase the number of purchasers of british goods by following a policy of fresh conquest and direct occupation of protected states like avadh many british officials political leaders and businessmen advocated reduction in land revenue so that the indian peasant might be in a better position to buy foreign manufactures they also advocated the westernization of india so that more and more indians might develop a taste for western goods indian hand made goods were unable to compete against the much cheaper products of british mills which had been rapidly improving their productive capacity by using inventions and a wider use of stem power any government wedded to indian interests alone would have protected indian industry through high tariff walls and use at the time thus gain to import the new techniques of the west britain had done this in relation on its own industries in the 8th 18th century france germany and the usa were also doing so at the time Japan and the Soviet Union were to do it many decades later and free india is doing it today however not only were indian industries not protected by the foreign rulers but foreign goods were also given free entry foreign imports rose rapidly imports of british goods sorry british cotton goods alone increased from 1 crore 1 lakh euros in 1832 uh 6 crore that uh 11 lakh euros in 1832 63 lakhs in 1856 
The free trade imposed on India was however one-sided. While the doors of India were thus thrown wide open to foreign goods, Indian products which could still compete with British products were subjected to heavy import duties upon entry into Britain. The British would not take in Indian goods on fair and equal terms even at this stage when their industries had achieved technological superiority over Indian handicrafts, duties in Britain on several categories of Indian goods continued to be high till their export to Britain virtually ceased. For example, in 1824, a duty of 67.5% per, 67 was levied on Indian calicos and a duty of 37.5% on Indian mus muslins. Indian sugar had to pay on entry into Britain a duty that was over three times its cost price. In some cases, duties in England went up here as a went up as high as 400 percent as a result of such a prohibitive import duties and development of mission industries indian exports to foreign countries fell rapidly the unfairness of british commercial policy had been summoned up by the british historian h h wilson in this in the following words it was start uh, it was stated in evidence that the cotton and silk goods of India up to this period could be sold for a profit in the British market at a price from 50 to 60 percent lower than those fabricated in England. It consequently became necessary to protect the later by duties of 70 to 80 percent on their value or by positive prohibition. Had this not been the case, not had not such a prohibitory duties and decreases existed the mills of uh, paisley and of uh, manchester would have been stopped in their outset and could uh, scarcely have been again set in motion even by the power of stream they were created by the sacrifice of the indian manufacturer had india been independent she uh, she would have retaliated would have imposed preventative duties upon British goods and would thus have preserved her own productive, productive industry from annihilation. This act of self-defense was not permitted her. She was at the mercy of the stranger. British goods were forced upon her without paying any duty and the foreign manufacturer employed the arm of political injustice to keep down and ultimately strangle a competitor with whom he could not have contended on equal terms. Instead of exporting manufacturers, India was now forced to export raw materials like raw cotton and raw silk which British industries needed urgently or plantation, plantations products like indigo and tea or, food, tea or food grains which were in short supply in Britain. In 1856, India exported 43 lakh worth of raw cotton only 81 lakh worth of cotton manufacturers, 2 crore 90 lakh worth of food grains, 1 crore 73 lakh worth of indigo and 7 crore 70, uh, sorry, 7 lakh 70 thousand worth of raw silk. The British also prompted the sale of Indian opium in China. Even though the Chinese placed a ban on it because of its uh, poisonous and un other harmful effects but the trade yielded large profits to british merchants and fat revenues to the company controlled administration of india interestingly enough the import of opium into britain was strictly banned by the end of the 19th century indian exports consisted primarily of raw cotton jute and silk oil seeds wheat hides and skins indigo and tea thus the commercial policy of the east india company after 1813 was guided by the needs of British industry. Its main aim was to transform India into a consumer of British manufacturers and a supplier of raw materials. The drain of wealth. The British exported to Britain part of India's wealth and resources for which Indigo got no advocate economic or material return. This economic drain was peculiar to British rule. Even the worst of previous Indian governments had spent the revenue they extracted from the people inside the country. 
whether they spent it on irrigation canals and trunk roads or on palaces temples and mosques or on wars and conquests or even on personal luxury it ultimately encouraged indian trade and industry or gave employment to indians this was so because even foreign conqueror like the mughals soon settled in india and made it their home but the british remained perpetual foreigners englishmen working and trading in india nearly always planned to go back to britain and the indian government was controlled by a foreign company of merchants and the government of britain the british consequently spent a large part of the taxes and income they derived from the indian people not in india but in britain their home country the drain of wealth from bengal began in 1757 when the company's servants began to carry home immense fortunes ex- extorted from indian rulers zamindars merchants and the common people they sent home nearly uh, 6 million between 1758 and 1765 this amount was more than four times the total land revenue collection of the nawab of bengal in 1765 this amount of drain did not include the trading profits of the company which were often no less illegal illegally derived in 1765 the company acquired the diwari of bengal and thus gained control over its revenues the company even more than its servants soon directly organized the drain it began to purchase indian goods out of the revenue of bengal and to export them these purchases were known as investments thus through investments big uh, bengals bengal's revenue was sent to england for example from 1765 to 1770 the company sent out nearly 4 million worth of goods or about 33% of the net revenue of bengal by the end of the 18th century the drain constituted nearly 9% of india's national income the actual drain was even more as a large part of the salaries and other incomes of english officials and the trading fortunes of english merchants also found their way into england the drain took the form of an excess of india's exports over its imports for which india got no return while the exact amount of the annual drain has not been calculated so far and historians differ on its quantum the fact of the drain at least from 1757 to 1857 was widely accepted by british officials thus for example lord Alan Borg, chairman of the Select Committee of the House of Lords and later Governor General of India, admitted in 1840 that India was required to transmit annually to this country. Britain, without any return except in the small value of military stores, a sum amounting to between two and three million sterling, and John Sullivan, President of the Board of Revenue, Madras, he marked. our system acts very much like a sponge drawing up all the good happens from the banks of the gangas and squeezing them down on the banks of the thames the drain continued to increase after 1858 though the british administrators and imperialist writers now began to deny its existence by the end of the 19th century it uh, constituted nearly 6% of india's national income and one third of its uh, national savings the wealth drained out of india played an important part in financing britain's capitalist development especially during the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century that is during the period of britain's early industrialization it has been estimated that it constituted nearly 2% of britain's national income during that period the figure assumes importance if it is a kept in view that britain was at at that time investing in industry and agriculture about 7% of its national income development of means of transport and communication up to the middle of the 19th century the means of transport in india were backward they were confined to the bullock cart and pack short the british ruler soon realized that a cheap and easy system of transport was a necessity if british manufactures were to flow into 
India on a large scale and her raw material secured for British industries, they introduced steamships on the rivers and set about improving the roads. Work on the Grand Trunk Road from Calcutta to Delhi was begun in 1839 and completed in the 1850s. Efforts were also made to link by road the major cities, ports and markets of the country. But real improvement in transport only came with the advent of the railways. The first railway engine designed by George Stephenson was put on the rails in England in 1814. Railways developed rapidly in that country during the 1830s and 1840s. Pressure soon mounted for their speedy construction in India. The British manufacturers hoped thereby to open the vast and hit head to and tapper market in the interior of the country and to facilitate the export of Indian raw materials and foodstuffs to feed their hungry missions and operatives. The British bankers and investors looked upon railway development in India as a channel for the safe investment of their surplus capital. The British steel manufacturers regarded it as an outlet for their produce products like rails, engines, wagons and other plant and machinery. The government of India soon fell in step with these views and found additional merit in the railways. They would enable it to administer the country more effectively and efficiently and to protect their rigam from internal rebellion or external aggregation by enabling rapid mobilization and movement of troops. The earlier suggestion uh, to build a railway in India was made in Madras in 1831. But the wagons of this railway were to be drawn by horses. Construction of steam driven railways in India was first proposed in 1834 in England. It was given strong political support by England's railway promoters, financiers, mercantile horses trading with India and textile manufacturers. It was decided that the, that the Indian railways were to be constructed and operated by private companies who were guaranteed a minimum of 5% return on their capital by the government of India. The first railway line running from Bombay to Tana was opened to traffic in 1853. Lord uh, Dalhousie, who became Governor General of India in 1849, was an ardent advocate of rapid railway construction. In a famous note written in 1853, he laid down an extensive program of railway development. He proposed a network of four main trunk lines which uh, would like the interior of the country with the big ports and interconnect the different parts of the country. By the end of 1869, more than 6,000 kilometers of railways had been built by the guaranteed companies, but this system proved a way costly and slow. And so, in 1869, the governor of India decided to build new railways as a state officials in India and businessmen in Britain. After 1880, railways were built through private enterprises as well as through state agencies. Uh, by 1905, nearly 45,000 kilometers of railways had been built. Three important aspects of the development of Indian railways should be kept in view. Firstly, nearly the entire amount of over 350 crores of rupees invested in them was provided by British investors, Indian capital contributing only a negligible share to it. Second, there were for the first 50 years financially losing concerns which were unable to pay interest on the capital invested in them. Uh, this loss was ma made good in the case of privately built railways by the government of India, which guaranteed a fixed return on the capital invested, while the interest rate in Britain in the 1850s was about 3%. The guaranteed return was an attractive 5%. Third, in their planning, construction and management, the economic and political development of India and her people was not kept in the forefront. On the contrary, the primary consideration was to serve the economic, political and military interests of British imperialism in India. The railway lines were laid primarily with a view to linking India's raw material producing 
areas in the interior interior with the ports of export the needs of indian industries regarding their markets and their sources of raw materials were neglected further the railway rates were fixed in a manner so as to favor imports and exports and to discriminate against the internal movement of goods several railway lines in burma and north western india were built at high cost to serve british imperial interests the british also established an efficient and modern postal system and introduced the telegraph the first telegraph line from calcutta to agra was opened in 1853 lord dalhousie introduced postage stamps previously cash payment had to be made when a letter was posted he also cut down postal rates and charged a uniform rate of half an anna for a letter all over the land before his reforms the post is on a letter depended on the distance it was to travel in some cases the post is on a letter was the equivalent of so much as four days wages of a skilled indian worker land revenue policy the company needed indian revenues to pay for its purchase of indian handicrafts and other goods for export meet the cost of the conquest of the whole of india and consolidation of british rule pay for the employment of thousands of englishmen in superior administrative and military positions at salaries that were fabulous by contemporary standards and no and to meet the cost of economic and administrative charges needed to enable colonialism to fully penetrate indian villages and the far flung areas this meant a steep rise in the burden of taxation on the indian peasants and in fact nearly all the major changes in the administration administration and judicial system till 1813 were geared towards the collection of land revenues the main burden of providing money for the trade and profits of the company the cost of administration and the wars of british expansion in india had to be borne by the indian peasant or right in fact the british could not have conquered such a vast country as india if they had no taxed the peasant heavily and the indian state had since time a memorial taken a part of the agricultural produce as land revenue it had done so either directly through its servants or indirectly through intermediaries such as zamindars revenue farmers etc who collected the land revenue from the cultivator and kept a part of its it as their commission these intermediaries were primarily collectors of land revenue although they did sometimes own some land in the area from which they collected revenue the permanent settlement we have seen that the that in 1765 the east india company acquired the diwani or control over the revenues of bengal bihar and orissa in delhi it made uh, an attempt to continue the old system of revenue collection so it increased the amount to be collected from rs One crore forty-two lakh and ninety thousand in seventeen twenty-two, and RS one crore eighty-one lakhs eighty thousand in seventeen sixty-four to RS two crores thirty-four lakhs in seventeen seventy-one. In seventeen seventy-three, it decided to manage the land revenues directly. Warren Hastings auctioned the right to collect revenue to the highest bidders. but his experiment did not succeed to so the amount of land revenue was pushed high by zamindars and other speculators biding against each other the actual collection varied from year to year and seldom came up to official exceptions expectations this introduced instability in the company's revenues at a time when the company was hard pressed for money moreover neither the right nor the zamindar would do anything to improve cultivation when they did not know what the next year's assessment would be or who the next year's revenue collector would be it was at this stage that the idea first emerged of fixing the land revenue at a permanent amount 
Finally, after prolonged discussion and debate, the permanent settlement was introduced in Bengal and Bihar in 1793 by Lord Cornwall's Cornwallis. It had two special features. First, the zamindars and revenue collectors were converted into so many landlords. They were not only to act as agents of the government in collecting land revenue from the right, but also to become the owners of the entire land in their zamindars. Zamindaris. Their right of uh, ownership was made hereditary and transferable. On the other hand, the cultivators were reduced to the low status of uh, mere tenants and were deprived of long-standing rights to the soil and other customary rights. The use of the pasture and forest lands, irrigation canals, fisheries and homestead plots and protection against enhancement of rent were some of the rights which were sacrificed. In fact, the territory of Bengal and Bihar was left entirely at the mercy of the zamindars. This was done so that the zamindars might be able to pay in time the exorbitant land revenue demand of the company. Second, the zamindars were to give 10 by 11th of the rental they derived from the peace center to the state, keeping only 1 by 11th for themselves. But the sums to be paid by them as land revenue were fixed in perpetuity. If the rental of a zamindar's estate, estate increased owing to extension of cultivation and improvement in agriculture or his capacity to extract more from his tenants or any other reason, he would keep the entire amount of the increase. The state would not make any further demand upon him. At the same time, the zamindar had to pay his revenue residually on the due date even if the crop had failed for some reason otherwise his lands were to be sold the initial fixation of land uh, fixation of revenue was made uh, arbitrarily and without any consultation with the zamindars the attempt of the officials was to secure the maximum amount as a result the rates of revenue were fixed very high between 1765 to 66 and 1793 the land revenue demand nearly doubled. John showed the man who planted the permanent settlement and later succeeded Cornwallis as Governor General cal uh, cal calculated that if the gross produce of Bengal be taken as 100, the government claimed 45, Jaminders and other intermediaries below them received 15 and only 40 remained with the actual cultivator. One result of this high and impossible land revenue demand was that nearly 1794, sorry, cultivator. One result of this high and impossible land revenue demand was that nearly half the Jamindari lands were put, put up for sale between 1794 and 1807. It was later generally admitted by officials and Non-officials alike that before 1793, the zamindars of Bengal and Bihar did not enjoy proprietary rights over most of the land. The question then arises, why did the British recognize them as such? One explanation is that this was in part the result of a misunderstanding. In England, the center, central figure in agriculture at the time was the landlord and the British officials made the mistake of thinking that the zamindar was his Indian counterpart. It is, however, to be noted that in one crucial respect, the British officials clearly differentiated between the poisonous of the two. The landlord in Britain was the owner of land not only in relation to the tenant but also in relation to the state. But in Bengal, while the zamindar was landlorded over the tenant, he was himself subordinated to the state. In fact, he was reduced virtually to the status of a tenant of the East India Company, in contrast to the British landlord who paid a small share of his income as land tax, he had to pay as tax 10 by 11th of his income from the land of which he was supposed to be the owner. And he could be returned, uh, he could be turned out of the land unceremoniously and his estate sold if he failed to pay the revenue in time. 
Other historians think that the decision to recognize the zamindars as the proprietors of land was basically determined by political, financial and administrative expediency. Here the guide, guiding factors were three. The first arose out of a clever state, uh, statecraft, the need to create political allies, the British officials realized that as they were foreigners in India, their rule would be unstable unless they acquired local supporters who, who would act as a buffer between them and the people of India. This argument had immediate important, importance as there were a large number of popular revolts in Bengal during the last quarter of the 18th century. So they brought into existence a wealthy and privileged class of Jamindars which owned its existence to British rule and which would therefore be compelled by its own basic interest to support it. This exception expectation was in fact fully justified later when the Jamindars as a class supported the foreign government in opposition to the rising movement of uh, rising movement for freedom. Second and perhaps the predominant motive was that of financial security before 1793. The company was troubled by fluctuations in its uh, chief source of income, the land revenue. The company was faced with a constant financial crisis as Bengal revenue had to finance its army engaged in wars of expansion, the civil establishment in Bengal, Madras and Bombay, and the purchase of manufacturers for export. The permanent settlement guaranteed stability of income. The newly created property of the Jamindars acted as a security for this. Moreover, the permanent settlement enabled the company to maximize its com income as land revenue was now fixed higher than it had ever been the in the past. Collection of revenue through a small number of Jamindars seemed to be much simpler and cheaper than the process of dealing with the lakhs of cultivators. Third, the permanent settlement was expected to increase agricultural production since the land revenue would not be increased in figure even if the Jamindars income went up. The later would be inspired to extend cultivation and improve agricultural productivity as first being done in Britain by its landlords. The permanent Jamindari settlements was later extended to Orissa, the northern districts of Madras and the district of Varanasi, in parts of central India and Avadh. British introduced a temporary Jamindari settlement under which the Jamindars were made owners of land but the revenue they had to pay was revised periodically another group of landlords was created all over india when the government started the practice of giving land to persons who had rendered faithful service to the foreign rulers the right water settlement the establishment of british rule in south and southwestern india brought new problems of land settlement the officials believed that in these regions there were no zamindars with large estates with whom settlement of land revenue could be made and that the introduction of the Jamindari system would upset the existing state of affairs. Many Madras officials led by Reid and Munro recommended uh, that state settlement should therefore be made directly with the actual cultivators. They also pointed out that uh, under the permanent settlement, the company was the financial loser, loser as it had to share the revenues with the Jamindaris and could not claim a share of the growing income from land. Moreover, the cultivator was left at the mercy of the Zamindar who could oppress him at will. Under the system the proposal, which is known as the Raithwara settlement, the cultivator was to be recognized as the owner of his plot of land subject to the payment of land revenue. The supporters of the Raithwara system claimed that it was a continuation of the state of affairs that had existed in the past. Munro said it is the system which has always prevailed in India. The right war settlement was in the end introduced in parts of the Madras and Bombay presidencies in the beginning of the 19th century. The settlement under the right war system was not made permanent. It was revised periodically after 20 to 30 years when the revenue demand was usually raised. The right war settlement did not bring into existence a system of peasants ownership. The peasants soon discovered that the large number of Jamindars had been replaced by 
one gain zamindar the state and that they were male government tenants whose land was sold if they failed to punctually pay land revenue in fact the government later openly claimed that uh, land revenue was rent and not a tax the rights rights of ownership of his uh, land were also negated by three other factors in most areas the land revenue fixed was exorbitant the right of was hardly left with a bare maintenance even in the best of seasons for instance in madras the government claim was fixed at a fixed as a high as 45 to 55% of gross production in the settlement the situation was nearly as bad in bombay the government retained a right to enhance land revenue at will the right had to pay revenue even when his produce was partially or wholly destroyed by drought or floods the mahalwari system a modified version of the zamindar settlement introduced in the ganga valley the north west provinces parts of central india and the punjab was known as the mahalwari system the revenue settlement was to be made village by village or estate mahal by estate with landlords or heads of families who collectively claim it to be the landlords of the village or the estate in the punjab a modified mahalwari system known as the village system was introduced in mahalwari areas also the land revenue was periodically revised both the zamindari and the raitwari system the departed fundamentally from the traditional land system of the country the british created a new form of private property in land in such a way that the benefit of the innovation did not go to the cultivators all over the country land was now made saleable mortgageable and alienable this was done primarily to protect the government's uh, revenue if land had not been made transferable or saleable the government would find it very difficult to realize revenue from a cultivator who had no savings or possessions out of which to pay it now he could borrow money on the security of this land or even spell part of it and pay his land revenue if he refused to do so the government could and often did auction his land and realize the amount another reason for introducing private ownership of land was provided by the belief that only the right of ownership would make the landlord or the right exert himself in making improvements the british by making land a commodity which could be freely brought bought and sold introduced a fundamental chance fundamental change in the existing land system of the country the stability and the continuity of the indian villages were shaken in fact the entire structure of our rural society began to break up thank you